to teach you thermodynamics from scratch, okay? Because it may be the case that you did it a long time ago and you need some reminders. And I'm going to use consistent terminology throughout. And so will the other lecturers who participate in this course, okay? And the terminology, the terminology is listed in your handout, so I won't go through it in detail. We will basically uh, come across these terms as we go through the lecture. Now the first thing we need to define is the internal energy, which we label capital U. Yeah. Okay. So imagine that you have a body here, and they put in a quantity Q of heat. Then by convention, when we put heat into a body, we label that as positive. Okay. And as a consequence of that heat, the body might expand, and it will do some work in pushing the surroundings. So, the total change in the internal energy of the body is the heat that went in less the work done by that body on the system. And you see that this internal energy is a function of state. Does anybody know what a function of state is? No. Go ahead. Something that doesn't depend on projection. Exactly. So, a function of state only depends on uh, initial. Yeah, what, what, what temperature the body is at, or what pressure it is at, but not how it got to that point, okay? So if I have a certain internal energy here, and another internal energy here, then these values are completely independent of the path by which I get from one point to the other. Okay. Are you defining um, omega for work? Hmm with a possible sign if it's done by the system or on the system? This is the work done by the body on the system. No. And that is always negative. That we define as negative. Because on, the, on the system is positive. Yeah. Because what we are doing is by the body doing work, we are losing internal energy. Yeah. So it makes sense to have that as negative. Does that make sense? Sure. Now, can I sort of say that this body has a certain amount of internal energy? Well, it's a, it's a bit difficult to say that, I think. You need some kind of a reference state, don't you? Yeah. And you don't know what that reference state would be. So, in general, when we are dealing with terms like you, we are more interested in changes in internal energy. Okay. So, in going from here to here, what is the change in internal energy? It's this term here, delta U. Okay. And if I express that as a, a differential equation, then an infinitesimal change in internal energy is equal to the small amount of heat that went in less the work done by the body on the system. And if you're operating at a constant pressure, then dW is simply P pressure times the volume change, isn't it? So that's uh, one of the most important thermodynamic parameters, the amount of energy in that body, the internal energy. Okay? Now, in your notes, you'll find two kinds of views. One is a bold font, which refers to the absolute value of the internal energy, so that would be let's say 500 joules or something like that. And there will be a capital U which is not bold, which is the amount of internal energy per mole of material, for example. Okay. So that's a molar internal energy. Now, of course, the amount of heat that a body absorbs depends on its heat capacity. If I change the temperature from T1 to T2, how much heat actually goes into the body depends on its ability to hold heat. And that's what we call heat capacity. Uh, it's the change in energy per unit change in temperature. Yeah. And remember from the previous slide that dQ is the change in internal energy and this term due to work done on the environment. Okay? So if I now differentiate this with respect to temperature at a constant pressure, 
then I get my heat capacity at constant volume is simply du by dt. This is a partial differential of the internal energy with respect to temperature. The pressure we are assuming is constant. You know, we are working in an atmospheric pressure here, so it's a reasonable thing to do. And this is the heat capacity uh, defined in this sphere. What would be the units of that heat capacity? Joule per Kelvin. Okay. And if I had expressed you as joules per mole, then it would be joules per mole per Kelvin. Okay. How would you go about measuring heat capacity? It goes back to your school days. Okay, if I asked you to measure the heat capacity of a body, how would you do it? What is the kind of instrument that you would use? Calorimeter, exactly. And maybe in your school days you had a quite a large container and you put in a, a body and you measured you know, how much heat is required and so forth. Nowadays we use equipment like this which is known as a differential scanning calorimeter where we might have a milligram of material. You don't need more than that. The essence of this instrument is very straightforward. You have your sample in a, conta a tiny container here and a reference in the other container. And the reference is such that it remains inert. It doesn't decompose or react or undergo a phase transformation. So for example, pure alumina. You then put your sample in here and you heat both the containers at a constant rate. And of course, if this is absorbing energy relative to this, then its temperature will be different. So from that temperature difference between the sample and reference, you can calculate the heat capacity or milligrams of material. You no longer need to do large samples as we used to do in the old days. And you, you can imagine it takes a long time for a large sample also to reach equilibrium. Where a small sample can reach it rapidly. And the whole of this thing would be actually quite small. So it's very easy to measure the heat capacity of materials. Now, if I go back to my first slide, I had uh, a body with a certain volume B. And in introducing that body into space, something had to be pushed. Yeah? And that something is the term P times V. So this is not, we are not talking now about the expansion of the body when I put in some heat, but in order to put that body there in the first place, that much work had to be done by the system. So it is convenient to define another thermodynamic quantity, which we call enthalpy, H, which is the sum of the internal energy and this external energy, because the whole of space has had to be expanded. Right? And this is the term that we normally deal with, rather than internal energy, because all experimental measurements done at atmospheric pressure really measure enthalpy rather than internal energy. Okay? And therefore, we can define a heat capacity at constant pressure, which is simply how much enthalpy is needed to alter the temperature by one Kelvin. This subscript over here simply means <coughs> that this is defined at constant pressure. Everybody happy with that? Now why, uh, why are we so interested in heat capacity? Well, I'll explain that uh, shortly. But first we need to think a little bit more about the difference between the heat capacity at constant pressure and at constant volume. If I ask you to do a measurement of the heat capacity of gas, do you think that Cp and Cv would be very different? Well, I know what the answer is. Yeah, go on. Well, one of them is Cv is three times R, the other one is five, five, sorry, three, three halves of R, the other one is five halves of R. Okay. Um, so, I'm cheating. No, that's okay. So, 
my question was different. It was that if we were measuring the heat capacity of a gas at constant pressure and at constant volume, would I expect these to be very different for a gas in magnitude? Okay. And compare that with a solid. Much smaller than solids. The difference. Yes. Right. So what I'm after is this term. And remember how enthalpy differs from internal energy. That means in order to place this body in space, the space had to be expanded, right? Now, of course, if this body is completely rigid, then you definitely will have to do more work to put that body in space than if it is a very compressible substance. Yeah? So the more compressible a material is, the greater will be the difference between Cp and Cv. In fact, this is proportional to 1 upon the bulk modulus. Now, do you know what the bulk mod modulus means? So, do you know what the elastic modulus means? Young's modulus. It's, it's, it's modulus. Stress yeah. above strain. Yeah. <coughs> it's the relationship between elastic stress and elastic strain. The bulk modulus is the relationship between pressure and volume of a substance. So if I have a very, very rigid material, this will be very large, and the difference between these two quantities will be negligible. If I have a very compressible substance, then the difference between these two quantities will be large. Okay. So for the gas, this values will be more than the solid? For a gas, it will be smaller than a solid. It's much easier to compress. Yeah. So if I plot pressure versus volume of the material, pressure and volume, then a gas might be something like this, and a solid, something like this. And the slope of this curve is related to the modulus. So gas is much easier to compress than a solid. So for a solid, we frequently neglect these differences between heat capacity at constant pressure and heat capacity at constant volume. <coughs> I haven't proven this to you, but really all I wanted to do is understand the difference between CP and CV. And in many cases, for a solid, H and U are almost identical. When the heat capacity has units of uh, joules per kelvin per mole, we say it's a specific heat capacity because it's for a particular amount of material. Again, this is in your list of nomenclature. It's a very useful quantity to know the heat capacity of a substance because just like we, uh, when we altered the temperature U1 became U2, if we know how much we altered the temperature and we know the heat capacity, then delta U is defined, isn't it? Because we altered the state of the body from U1 to U2 by pumping in heat. We know the temperature difference between U1 and U2. And if we know its heat capacity, then delta U is simply heat capacity multiplied by delta T, isn't it? Assuming that the heat capacity remains constant. Similarly, we can work out the enthalpy change in going from a temperature T1 to a temperature T2 by taking the integral of Cp dt. Assuming now we are not making any assumptions about whether Cp is constant or not. In general, it varies with temperature. So if you know for a chemical reaction, say, the enthalpy change at a particular temperature, and you know the heat capacities of the reactants and products, then you can work out the enthalpy change at any temperature. <coughs> so this is how we measure thermodynamic quantities. You already know now how to measure the enthalpy change of a substance, because you measure the heat capacity using a calorimeter, 
and therefore you can work out the enthalpy change as a function of temperature. Are you happy with that? Sometimes you wonder where all these free energies come from, where they are measured. They are all measured quantities. Thermodynamics is essentially empirical. It relies completely on measured quantities. But it does set rules. And you'll discover those rules as we go along. And those rules are very rigorous. Okay, so we've got a reaction here where two components, A and B, are combining to give us a quantity C. And my question is, how can we decide whether this reaction should happen or not? Yeah, and now of course you need to be more specific. What kind of energy? Enthalpy. Okay. So, what we are saying is that the reaction will proceed if the enthalpy change is positive or negative. Positive means that you've increased enthalpy in going from here to here, because enthalpy change is final minus initial. Okay, so we are arguing that a reaction will be possible. Right. Possible if energy is too loose at home. Yeah. Reaction possible if enthalpy reduced. That is that the H equals H final minus H initial is negative. <coughs> now, notice that I've used the term possible. Just because there's an energy reduction, that doesn't mean the reaction will necessarily happen, but it is possible that it will happen. Why is it the case that it may not necessarily happen? <coughs> Okay, that's very good, but uh, you're jumping ahead. See, we are, we are starting from zero. I haven't defined it. <coughs> but supposing that the statement is correct, okay, that the reaction is possible if the enthalpy is reduced, why may it not occur anyway? And if the state is very really ordered one, can go from disordered state to ordered state. Um, I haven't I haven't made any assumptions about what A is, B is, C is, but we came up with the general conclusion that a reaction if possible is possible if enthalpy is reduced. I mean can thermodynamics tell us everything is my question. You see window glass over there is amorphous. Yeah? Kinetic. There may be a huge barrier in the way towards a lower state of free energy. So if this is, uh, let me just get a better pen. If I'm plotting here the enthalpy, say, and coordinate, a reaction coordinate, then sure, H2 might be less than H1, but we still have to get over some kind of a barrier. And that's kinetics. We are not going to deal with that at all in this set of lectures. Now, I'm going to demonstrate to you that this conclusion is actually wrong. Okay. I'm going to show you a reaction which will happen even though there is no change in enthalpy. And I want you to think about a gas, which is an ideal gas. An ideal gas means that it doesn't matter how far apart the atoms are, you don't change the state of the system. Okay. So here is, uh, oops. here is a cylinder, okay. and it contains gas on one side of the cylinder and a vacuum on the other side. If I 
allow this gas to move, if I drill a hole here, between this partition, what do you expect will happen? The gas will be distributed like this, so that the pressure becomes a half, right? But this is an ideal gas. So the enthalpy here is exactly the same as the enthalpy here, because I said to you that it doesn't matter if you move the atoms away from each other. So why should it move? Why is it that if I start over here, <coughs> all of the atoms will end up on just one side? Why don't you expect that? Um, because this uh, disorder system is naturally lower energy than um, an order system. Our systems will tend yeah. to become disordered. We, we have this uh, drummed into us that the system will always tend to become disordered. <coughs> what I want you to understand is a bit more than that. Yeah? Uh, I want you to explain to me why you wouldn't expect all these atoms to suddenly move in the same direction and even without a wall over here all of them end up on this side with the pressure P and a vacuum on the other side. Why isn't that possible? Well, it's a matter of probability. That's it. All that can start to happen. Yeah. It can happen. It can happen. You know, in fact, if I, if I drop a, a glass of water on the floor, you expect it to spill and the glass to break. But it is also possible that all the pieces will come back together and jump onto the table. It's just an incredibly, incredibly unlikely event. And that is why we say that um, this is a much, much, much more probable distribution of gas atoms than this, even, if, even after I've removed this partition. Okay. This is a far more probable event than this. And that is why we say that you know, nature favors an increase in disorder. You could regard this as a disordered state because here the atoms are organized on one side of the cylinder. So here is a reaction which is happening without any change in enthalpy. So clearly this, this is not correct. On its own it's not correct. We have to take account of probabilities and we express that as the term entropy. So even if the enthalpy change is zero, a reaction may occur spontaneously if delta S is greater than zero. That means the change in entropy is positive. So think about entropy in terms of probabilities. It's a better way to think about it. So we need to consider both enthalpy changes and entropy changes to decide whether a reaction is possible or not. Now, how do we measure entropy? Well, the change in entropy is the amount of heat you put into the system, the infinitesimal amount, divided by temperature. And that immediately gives us a relationship between the change in entropy and the heat capacity. So, you know, with that calorimeter, we can measure the heat capacity, and therefore, we can define changes in entropy as well. So, delta S is the integral from T1 to T2 of Cp over T times Cp. This is a stupid question. Why is Ds defined like that? So, I'm doing this at a constant temperature. Mm -hmm. I'm adding this amount <coughs> of heat at a constant temperature. So, what is delta H? It's zero, isn't it? Yeah? But nevertheless, the system has changed. And the only other thing that changes is entropy. The derivation of this is quite lengthy. But do you follow the argument? Yeah, I'm just thinking of the, the example of this box. Well, there's actually any heat change. No, I've added, I've added an infinitesimal amount of heat at a constant temperature. 
So something has happened, which is not an enthalpy change, because enthalpy change will be integral of Cp dt. So it's not at all actually a stupid question. It's a very useful question to ask. Now, now we can come back to your free energy. The free energy is simply the consequence of enthalpy and of entropy. Okay, so H minus T delta S gives you the free energy. And it is absolutely true to say that a reaction will be possible spontaneously if delta G is negative. Okay? So that's completely rigorous. That in a spontaneous reaction, the free energy will be reduced. This is in fact called the Gibbs free energy, because we, are, we have enthalpy over here. If we had internal energy, then you would call it the Helmholtz free energy. But we will be using G most of the time. So really, we've defined all the important terms that are necessary in thermodynamics. There's nothing more to define. We've got Gibbs free energy, we've got enthalpy, and we've got entropy and heat capacity. With those few thermodynamic terms, you can treat the whole of the subject. So if you understand the physical meaning of these terms, then you should be happy with the rest of the course. Okay, let's think about heat capacity in a bit more detail now. Uh, you mentioned earlier that the heat capacity is approximately 3R. Now what is R? Uh, it's actually the gas constant. Gas constant. Okay, so you mentioned that the capacity is approximately equal to 3R. And do you know where that comes from? <coughs> okay, so well, let's just so prove it. Hmm? Well, let's just think about an oscillator. Okay, so we've got a pendulum which is swinging like this and you're changing kinetic energy with potential energy and the kinetic energy mm -hmm. will be, you know, half m squared sorry? M yeah, half m squared m squared and the potential energy will be the same yeah? so for every degree of freedom we have half kT of kinetic energy and half kT of potential energy if you're in three dimensions <coughs> then that comes to 3 kT. And if you take a mole of material, then you replace the K with R. Okay, so if the total energy is 3 kT, and I differentiate that with respect to temperature to get the heat capacity, then I get 3 K. Okay, and that's where this comes from. What are the assumptions I've made about the oscillator? You've <coughs> got 3 degrees of freedom in three dimensions for atoms to oscillate, right? Is there any assumption there? Yeah, that they're completely independent. Now, can you see any difficulties when you come to a solid? Yeah, sorry? There's not free motion possible. That's right, that's right. So if one atom jiggles this way, you know, then the others will also tend to go in that direction, won't they? So all these oscillators in a solid are not independent. They have to do correlated motions. Now, of course, that is a cost. You know, to make them all vibrate in the same direction is more difficult than having it all independent oscillators, right? So the actual heat capacity of a solid will be a lot less than 3R. Uh, so in discussing these oscillators, I've, I've really focused on atoms vibrating. They're located on the lattice and they're vibrating. But remember that if you have a metal, you have an electron gas inside the metal. So should I, should I add 
another term here, which is an electronic contribution because the electrons are oscillating. Should I add another 3R? Yeah, we've got a term due to the oscillation of atoms, which is, which is not quite the same as a, a free gas, but if I go to a high enough temperature, even the atoms in a solid will vibrate independently and you have the heat capacity of a gas in a solid. But we have another gas in a metallic <coughs> solid, which is the free electrons. So should I, should I argue that I will have a heat capacity of 6R at a high enough temperature? Why, why not? Because the movement is correlated. Mm, I can go to a high enough temperature to lose that correlation. Right? So if I do that, should I have 6R? Is there anything special about electrons compared with atoms other than the charge? Yeah, so supposing I have, uh, I have shells, okay? And um, I can place atoms on those shells, any number of atoms on any one of those shells. Yeah? There's no restriction on how many atoms I can place on any particular shell, the shell representing energy. Does that give you a clue? If I have the same set of shelves for electrons, is there anything restricting the number of electrons I can place on each energy level? What is it? Well, I mean, you can. <coughs> You're on the right track. Is that is there some sort of principle which says, what is it called? The Pauli exclusion principle, which says you can only have two electrons with opposite spins on any energy level. That means that as you fill up the energy levels, it's only the ones right at the highest level which will be able to participate in energy absorption. So this term is actually very, very small. And that's why you can't think about electrons in a solid as a free electron gas that gives you the wrong heat capacity. There could be another term here, which is due to magnetic transitions. So, for example, iron at 800 degrees centigrade will not be ferromagnetic. That means all the magnetic moments are not aligned. As I go below the Curie temperature, they become aligned. And therefore, there is a change in entropy, isn't there? First, they are randomly oriented, and then they become aligned. That will absorb energy. And that's the magnetic contribution to heat capacity. Can you think of additional factors which come in when I talk about polymers? Any additional mechanisms of heat absorption? Yes, uh, special modes of vibration, for example, rotations of groups around bonds. Okay. Furthermore, a polymer chain likes to be curled up rather than straight. Okay. That is also an entropy effect. When I, when I take a piece of rubber and I hang a weight, the weight will be pulled up if I raise the temperature. Okay. That's because the chains want to be more and more curled up as you go to higher temperatures. So, whatever modes of vibration, etc., they will all contribute to heat capacity. Okay. And just to show you the difference between, uh, between a gas in which all the oscillators uh, uh, can take any energy, depending on how much energy you put in, See, this is what's known as a Boltzmann distribution. At a particular temperature, the distribution is like this. As I raise the temperature, there's no restriction on how many atoms can go to a higher energy. No restriction at all. Yeah. On the other hand, with electrons, I start filling in the states. Yeah. 
two electrons per state. And it's only at the very end, where I've completely filled the states, that I can actually promote electrons to a higher energy level. So it's only these which are free to absorb energy. And therefore they make a very, very small contribution to heat capacity. These simply cannot jump from here to here. The difference in energy is very large. This, this interval here is approximately kT. So only those electrons can participate in the absorption of energy. Okay, so this is how uh, the heat capacity of a solid, um, the atoms vibrating, varies as a function of temperature. At low temperatures, really the vibrations have to be correlated, so they're not each, at, each, each atom is not an independent oscillator, and therefore the heat capacity is much lower than you would expect from a free gas. The temperature at which a solid begins to behave like a gas is called the Debye temperature. And typically, this is ridiculously high. You know, for example, for iron, it would be about 15,000 Kelvin, which is way beyond the melting temperature of iron. So, it is a useful thing to know about because it defines the shape of this curve, but <coughs> it's, it, it's of no practical importance. You will never get a heat capacity as high as 3R in a solid. Just to give you an idea of specific heat capacities, this is a periodic table and the red color means a very high specific heat capacity and that means a very low heat capacity. And this is hydrogen, this is helium, which have very, very high heat capacities. And that's why when we're using gas to quench materials, we use helium because it can absorb a lot more energy than, for example, argon over here. This is about 10 times greater amount of uh, heat capacity than argon. Here we are talking about specific heat capacity, that means for a given quantity of material. So it isn't surprising that the heat capacities are largest for the light element because it's joules per gram per calorie. This is uh, to show you the difference between you know, just the vibrations of atoms and other terms coming in. So this is the cubic F form of iron. If it was just an, uh, a question of lattice vibrations, then this would be the heat capacity as a function of temperature. But we also have magnetic terms here which are giving an additional contribution to the capacity. And in the case of body-centered cubic iron, this is very, very large. In fact, body-centered cubic iron would not exist at room temperature if it weren't for this magnetic component of the heat capacity. You would not have a billion tons of steel produced every year if it wasn't for this magnetic component. We would have another form of iron, which is hexagonal uh, close packed. And hexagonal materials are very poor in their mechanical properties because they don't have many slip systems. They can't deform very easily, so they behave in a brittle way. So we owe magnetism here a lot. You know, just imagine if you removed all the steel from your life, you'd be in big trouble. So this actually is a very, very large effect. And the temperature below which uh, we have magnetic ordering is called the Curie temperature. But notice that there is some, something going on even above that ordering temperature. This is the region where we get long range order. Okay. That means you go a long distance in the lattice and you still have all the magnetic moments aligned. But even when we destroy long-range order, we'll, there will be some short-range order persisting in the system until we go to a high enough temperature. So these are extremely important terms which come into uh, determining the stability of the material. So, can you tell from the plot that it's more or less stable? 
No, you can't tell from this plot alone. What you have to do is you have to do total energy calculations. Okay? You will be doing these calculations in uh, one of the courses. So here we are plotting total energy, which you can calculate from first principles. Okay? And here we are plotting lattice parameters. Say. And the curve for hexagonal closed back diagonal would look like this, and this would be its equilibrium less parameter. If I do body centered cubic diagonal, without magnetism, it actually has a higher total energy. If I include magnetism, it comes below that. Okay. So this is magnetic. So these calculations uh, are routine calculations. Uh, you know, if I wanted to calculate the total energy of iron in its diamond structure, I could do it, even though it doesn't exist. Uh, this will be covered in Dr. Bristow's course. Now, we've done, as I said, all the terms that we need to deal with thermodynamics. We've got internal energy, we've got enthalpy, free energy, entropy, and heat capacity. There's really no more than that. I want you now to think about equilibrium. How would I define equilibrium between two forms of iron, say austenite and ferrite? Yeah? How would I use those parameters to say that, look, these two phases are in equilibrium? So this is pure iron we are talking about. It's just like having ice and water. Ice has a certain structure, water has another structure. And you can see ice sometimes floating about in water. And the proportion of ice is not changing compared with the proportion of water, which means that they are in equilibrium. And no matter how long you observe them, if they are in equilibrium, it will remain. And you will see no change. So how can I define that in terms of the thermodynamic parameters we discussed today? Well, free energy point from one to the other would be the same. Free energy? Sorry, I think you're... In yeah, the free energy point from phase A to phase B would be the same. The as same. From phase okay. to phase yeah. That's mm -hmm. correct. So, if I plot, say if we are plotting temperature on the horizontal axis, it could be anything. It could be pressure or magnetic field or whatever. And free energy on the vertical axis. Then for each of those phases, I could define the free energy as a function of temperature. And let's call this uh, the ferrite, alpha. And the way in which the free energy varies the temperature for the other phase might be like this. Now, where is equilibrium on that diagram? Yeah, where they have exactly the same free energy. So this is the equilibrium temperature. Allotropic transition simply means that it's a transition in which there's no change in composition. Okay? It's just different ways of arranging atoms of the same material, like ice water or body centered cubic iron to uh, cubic F iron and so forth. It's straightforward to define equilibrium between two phases. What I'd like you to think about for the next lecture is this ice water analogy again. But this time, we have seawater, right? Seawater contains salt, doesn't it? And do you know that the ice that forms from seawater has a different chemical composition? Do you know that it's purer? It's almost like pure water? So you crystallize ice from seawater, it'll be pure. So if ever you're stuck out in the sea without any water, and a bit of ice comes along, that's great because you can drink that melted and drink okay? But we've got lots of icebergs floating about in seawater and they're at equilibrium with the seawater. Why is that? You know, even though they have different chemical compositions. See, on this diagram, I could have another axis here, which is chemical composition. How can I have two solids, or, or a liquid and a solid, in equilibrium when they have different chemical compositions? <coughs> I mean, you all know about diffusion, that if I have a gradient of concentration, 
but then you get homogenization happening. You know, solid rich regions will go, uh, will, will diffuse material towards the solid poor regions, right? So how come we can have ice in equilibrium with salty water? That means they have different chemical compositions, and yet they will never change. That's what I'd like you to think about for the next lecture. Okay? Do you have any questions? Okay, see you tomorrow. Okay, see you.